will be shocked to hear that the proposal you make would find me in violation of the Elections Act. The Elections Act has now explicitly uh, forbidden parties to work together to stop another party or parties working together in relation to candidates. So in for I definitely want to cooperate with everybody in a minority parliament after an election, but um, I could go on about this. This is a, a particularly, I think it's a difficult thing that, that the Elections Act entrenches partisanship to that extent, but it does. Uh, meanwhile, I'll do my very, very best in the national leadership, national leaders debate, the televised debate, to, to, to make sure that, that people in your riding will consider that they don't find their own member of parliament to be, um, well, I'll do my best to make sure that he doesn't uh, ever have very many MPs elected with him. Because their policies on, that's the number one reason, their policies on climate are basically, Andrew Scheer's personal attitude is the problem. There are many good conservative MPs who understand the climate crisis and would like to do something about it, but uh, one of those MPs is not Andrew Scheer. <laughs> Elizabeth, I'm quickly now trying to put my thoughts together before we get on the plane. Um, I just, at the beginning, I'd just like to say, you know, I don't want to dwell upon the SNC thing, but my observation, for what it's worth, is that the two ministers actually represent real existing liberalism in this society, and it's come into conflict with the, what is used, neoliberalism. And th that, PMO is basically, and part, part, parts perhaps of the cabinet, is just corporatism extended into the political sphere, and that's unfortunate. Ron, can you say your name? Oh, Ron Bourgeois. Ron? Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I'll, I'm, I'll just say it. I want to raise something else. I'm a member of the NDP. I'm a cautious member, but I agree with much of what you would be saying publicly and here tonight. And I want to start with this. You said we got to go back to the, start looking at the 1960s and then the, the Medicare and, and uh, unemployment insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And then the question of uh, the youth today and, and uh, education. Um, Canadians, I think, I just, I'll put it out. You know, during that time, and I raised this in the leadership of the, of the NDP, and they didn't want to deal with it or didn't understand it. The Bank of Canada functioned as a public bank. So when Tommy Douglas did what he did here in Saskatchewan, it came from borrowing from the Bank of Canada. The national government, the provincial governments, and municipal governments could borrow. Student loans came from the Bank of Canada. That's why it was uh, held low. But given what you said about social justice and, and on and on, I think we have to bring out publicly a national strategy for resources and transportation in the image of what you started off with about the 1960s and the 1970s. You know, we've got to start looking at that. We also have to start looking at, and given what you said about Vietnam and pipelines and all, I listened to it. We got to start thinking of a strategy of tradition of transition away from that. You just can't cut it off. Yeah. And I, I give to you, and I'll end with this. I'll give to you this example. Andrew McFork was through town here a couple of weeks ago, and on the afternoon, the CBC uh, phone ins and that he says, "Look at um, on environmentalism. You've got." what is called a high wage, or the labor aristocracy. He says, you just can't cut that off immediately. It's gonna create havoc. Look at the United States. But what you just said, a national strategy of the, of the national government setting a vision of transition away without gutting the economy. Yes. Well, Ron, thank you. And I'll, first of all, I wanna say that it, as you referred to Jody Wilson Rabel and Jane Philpott as representing real liberalism, I think they represent real integrity. And what I think is interesting is that Justin Trudeau's best self was in thinking, I want to recruit people of stellar reputation who aren't traditionally part of the party. 
They want to come recruit someone like Joey wilson Rabel, vice chair, you know, a regional chief of Assembly First Nation from Kwakwaka'wakw tradition, a matrilineal, matriarchal society where her family is of hereditary chiefs and she's a woman of honor and, and a lawyer and a prosecutor and what a, what a, what a life she's had. And then uh, Jane Philpott, I don't know how many of you know about Jane, but she's a very devout Mennonite. She's a medical doctor. She did her work overseas in development. Uh, her toddler died from a rare disease when she was doing development work in Africa. And she's just, she's a person of great integrity. And in putting them on a cabinet, then there was an assumption, by, obviously by some of the old boys, that they'll play the game once they get power. Right now, I watch so many pundits trying to figure out, well, what's the end game? What are Jody Wilson Raybould and Jane Feldbach really up to? <laughs> Could it be that they want to respect the rule of law? That they haven't done a it's calculus of how this affects mm -hmm. their own political future or the country or Trudeau or Sherry are not playing games, they're just doing what they must do because they're people of integrity. So I will give Justice Trudeau this. He attracted some fine people into his cabinet and he ought to bend over backwards to get them back because then people could have some trust. The people fulfilling those jobs are people who are willing to step away from power voluntarily to protect the rule of law. And I think it's, it's an extraordinary, it's not quite a drama and it's not quite a soap opera. So, Bopper, I mean, there's so much media attention because some reporters like it as drama and soap opera. Mm -hmm. But what it really is about is can we have in our democratic institutions a recognition that some things don't budge just because the almighty transnational corporation with its, no, et cetera, uh, decrees that it's so. But back to Bank of Canada, we should absolutely revisit borrowing from the Bank of Canada. Interest free loans from the Bank of Canada are one of the things that we have to create a lot of our wealth, our, 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 our public infrastructure. We also need to have a strategy on social justice. Um, and I'll just share one of the Green Party platform notions to you and, and not take too long with this, but we're a country that acts as though we are separate nation states that can't communicate with each other. I put it to you that within the European Union, there's better cooperation and coordination than there is between some of the provinces that are Canada. So we need to recognize that all Canadians have more in common than in the difference. We're all neighbors, we're all friends, we all love each other. Fed, fake divisions between Alberta and BC and Saskatchewan and the rest is very unhelpful and unhealthy. So what I want to do is put together something based on a decision-making structure from Australia which in Australia is called the Council of Australian Governments, which is municipal, provincial, federal. For Canada, we need to be a Council of Canadian Governments that includes in, in First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So if you picture a, 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 a circle with four quadrants, one is the federal, one is provincial, one is municipal or government, the other is indigenous, and we should set up these tables to forge consensus on every area where we currently have no national strategy, have no national policy, which guess what is everything? We, we don't have a national policy on transportation, we don't have a national energy policy, we don't have a strategy, we have a federal government alone housing policy, and I have to say I'm grateful the liberals have gotten the federal government back into social housing. But we don't have policies, I mean, I get people coming in to see me all the time from different um, lobby groups, and they always start breathlessly as if I don't know this, but they say, did you know Canada's the only country in the OECD that has no cultural policy? And the next group comes in and says, do you know Canada's the only country in the OECD that has no transportation policy? Anyway, we need to have shared goals, and then every order of government that's executing towards those goals within their own jurisdiction is working together. So instead of having, you know, public revenues spent pulling in other, in opposite directions, we all are delivering towards the same goals. And I think that would be so healthy and, and it, it would be the best way to ensure that public dollars are spent wisely is that we're all working towards the same thing. Your other key point is that we need to make sure that people know there's a job for them and that this is a transition. We do need to do that and there are just as, there are more jobs in a green economy, for instance, just attacking all the leaky buildings we have across Canada. Using abandoned, we only, I only came across this recently, that abandoned oil wells that represent a liability to companies and ultimately to the public in Canada can be converted to geothermal plants that produce energy 
from the drilled well that bring that where you can get down fast to where where you have the heat that delivers geothermal. There are so many ways, whether renewable energy, we should give solar panels free so people can get them on roofs everywhere so the buildings that are producing more energy can use. I get excited about the direction in which we're headed. And thanks for your question, Ron. Who has the next microphone? I think we have one of our younger participants. My How can we stop climate change? How can we stop climate change? How old are you, sweetheart? Five. No, six. <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Uh, we can stop climate change by using energy sources that don't hurt us, like the wind and the sun, and the ground, and the waves, and the water. And they're all very good sources of energy because once we put in the machinery that captures that wind, and sun, and water, we don't need to buy fuel ever again because it's all free because it comes from the sun, and the wind, and the water, and the ground. We can also stop climate change by planting trees wherever we can, as many as we can, all the time. And we can also plant our own gardens and make sure that as much as possible all around us we grow our own food, and all around us we have as many plants as possible. And then, of course, there's moving away from the internal combustion engine. And now I'm going to go with the policy one language. And I think I've stopped it where I can for a question from someone who is five foot ten and six. <laughs>
for the F-35s. And the reason the F-35s were gonna be so expensive is that they had to be uh, stealth fighters that could evade another country's radar so we could get into another country before they saw us coming so we could bomb them first. And I don't see any strategic or military or policy assessment of Canada's future foreign policy or security threats where there's any need to get to another country to bomb them first. Our bigger risks, by the way, would be if we allow Huawei technology to be 5G, and so the government of the People's Republic of China could control all of our infrastructure. I think that's a bigger risk, but that's an, another matter. In other words, the, the security risks of the future are not armed forces threatening to invade us. It's climate change, it's threats like infiltration of our technology and infrastructure and internet, it's things like trying to steal our elections through Facebook and Google and bots and trolls. We have to be very alert to real security threats and know that where we put our money should be on the ones that are real and not the ones that belong to the 20th century.